Greetings, urban farmers, gardeners, and healthy food visionaries. Farmer Greg here, and welcome to the 576th episode of the Urban Farm Podcast, where every day we work together to educate and inspire you to become part of your food revolution. Stay tuned for the most amazing deal on bulk seeds and seed-saving education you have ever seen. Normally around this time of year, our team puts on an event called the Great American Seed Up, where we pack hundreds of people into a room over a few days to scoop amazing open pollinated and heirloom seeds for their gardens. We came up with the scoop your own model because the majority of the cost of seeds is actually in the packaging and distribution. So by eliminating these costs, people can buy the seeds in bulk at bulk prices. Well, as you can imagine, packing hundreds of people in a room is not feasible these days. So we had to get creative and we came up with seed up in a box. And what's amazing about it is that now you can get these bulk seeds wherever you are in the world. We've chosen seeds that are popular, non-GMO, open pollinated, and easy to grow. They're bundled 10 jumbo packs per variety so that you can share them with your community, family, church, or school. Your job is to split them into individual packages. Our job is to make them as inexpensive as possible. And right now they're averaging about 60 cents per individual jumbo portion. With all the uncertainty in the world, a lot of people are thinking about how we can make our future more food secure. Seed Up in a Box is a great way to do this because each bundle has enough seeds and education so that you may never have to purchase seeds again. This is an amazing deal and I'm so excited for the opportunity to take the great American Seed Up all around the world via our Seed Up in a Box. Learn more about Seed Up in a Box and get your own bundle by going to greatamericanseedup.org. That's greatamericanseedup.org. Today on our podcast, we have a young farmer with a long family history of farming. We're talking with Casey Cox about the story of her family peanut farm. Casey is the sixth generation of her family to farm on Flint River in South Georgia. Her family farm, Long Leaf Ridge, produces sweet corn, peanuts, field corn, soybeans, and timber. Prior to returning to the farm full-time, Casey managed the Flint River Soil and Water Conservation District, serving as executive director for over five years. In this role, she developed and directed multiple projects with federal, state, and private partners and was responsible for procuring and managing over $13.5 million of funding for conservation programs. She was appointed by Secretary Sonny Perdue in 2019 to serve as Georgia's alternate board member on the National Peanut Board. Congratulations. Casey holds a Bachelor of Science in Natural Resource Conservation from the University of Florida. Her most significant professional contribution to date was teaching Cookie Monster and Gonger, where peanut butter comes from, on Sesame Street in season 49. How fun is that? I'm sure we'll talk about that. Welcome to the show today, Casey. Are you ready to rock? Let's go. Excellent. So I shared a bit about you. Can you fill in the blanks for us and share more about the path you took to get where you're at today? Absolutely. So my story really started, obviously, growing up on the farm. It it was a huge part of my life and probably something I took for granted uh, because it it really has shaped who I am, shaped so much of my identity. But of course, that was something I didn't quite realize until I left, (laughs) So like most high school students, I wasn't too sure what I wanted to do, but I knew I wanted to move far away from the farm and probably never come back. And it didn't take too long (laughs) while I was in college to change my mind. I And and I'm really grateful. I'm actually an only child. And even with the history that my family has, my parents never pressured me to come back. That was completely my decision. And they were very supportive and very encouraging, but they ultimately just wanted me to be happy. Uh, But right before I left for college, I attended a meeting at our neighbor's place about, it was about some water issues, about the Flint River. And I remember my mom saying to me, she said, I know you're about to leave for college and and we don't know where, where you're going to wind up, but it's really important for you to always know what's going on in your backyard. And, and where you grew up. And that, that was really pivotal for me because that meeting 
was talking about some of the issues with the river and 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 how they intersected with agriculture and farming and and that resonated with me really strongly and that actually was the same week I was choosing what major oh, I nice. wanted to, to do in college <laughs> so uh, at, and the University of Florida had this incredible program of natural resource conservation and I and so I was able to pick that path and, and that really changed the course of, of my life in a lot of ways because as soon as I got into those program or so, as soon as I got into my program and started taking some of those classes, I realized how special my childhood was, how unique our, our family business is. You know, I really had that mentality because I grew up in a, in a farming community that everyone was familiar with agriculture and familiar with farming. And then I went to a large university where there were people from all over the country, all over the world, and, and people who, who grew up very differently from me. And I, I, that just really helped me understand how different <laughs> my life was and, and how unique of an opportunity I had. So I started thinking towards coming back to the farm really in, in my freshman, sophomore year of college and or not coming back to the farm, but coming back to Southwest Georgia and then eventually decided that I ultimately wanted to return to the farm full time. But my parents and I thought it would be a great idea for me to work off the farm for a few years to gain some really valuable insight and perspective. And that has proven to be one of the best decisions All I've that. ever made, too, because I loved my first job. Yes, it was it was so it, it, it was really important for me to do that, to build confidence and, and meet other people in the agriculture and conservation industry. And I really feel like that role has created an incredible foundation for me going forward. So uh, this is my first year full time on the farm without any other any other jobs or uh, other other responsibilities. And it has been quite a year. <laughs> 2020 is quite a year to start something new. Oh, my gosh. And, uh, no but I, I work with my dad. <laughs> I, uh, I work with my dad full time and, and it's really been a huge blessing. And I, I tell people all the time that deciding to come back to Southwest Georgia and return to our family farm was the best decision I've ever made in my life. Wow. Well, you know, so I actually saw you on a Netflix TV show. And one of the things that <laughs> ins- right. one of the things that inspired me to reach out to you and and ask you to be on the podcast is you're a young person. And there's not too many young people out there that are farming. And there's a big and here. And you have a family farm to do it on, which is huge. Tell me about that. Exactly. That That's something that, like I said, growing up, I really took for granted what a special opportunity that I had and, and having a family farm and land and, and this legacy here that, that I could return to. It was something that I just didn't understand how unique or special it was. And now that I do, I'm just so filled with gratitude that I have this opportunity. And yes, it, it is definitely, there There are young farmers out there. Obviously, there, there are several of us, but it is, it's not the norm. Agriculture is such a risky industry to go into. It's so much easier to just pick a steady job in a, in a city somewhere and just know you're going to have a steady income that you're what you work for all year isn't wiped out by a natural disaster. But there there's something so special in coming back home to a place that, that just has this indescribable pull on your heart and your soul because it, it's just almost a part of who you are. And, and that's really what our farm is for me. I didn't realize how connected I was to our land and to our farm until I left. And, and that really opened my eyes. And it has been such a great opportunity to return to the farm. And, and I will say, I'm, I really didn't know how people would re- react to that within the local community. Other farmers, you know, my parents cautioned me that other people may not take me seriously, especially as a young woman coming back to the farm. Right. And I have been so pleasantly surprised at the reception that I've had, especially with some of the older, more traditional farmers that you wouldn't expect <laughs> to be as as positive as they've been. But some of the people that you would that, that would surprise you the most are the ones who have become my, my biggest cheerleaders oh, nice. because they're so excited that someone young is coming back to this community and is and is not only returning to the family farm, but is also speaking out and speaking up for agriculture and our community and, and our way of life and and really taking taking advocacy and leadership to the to the next generation. So my community has been so wonderful and, and I just always want to give them credit because this, this industry is tough and I have incredible support from from my family. 
but it, it's so nice to also have that support from the community and know that there are people within within the industry as a whole, and then of course my local community who are who are rooting for me and want to see me succeed. Right. Well, and I suspect that being the executive director for the Flint River Soil and Water Conservation District for five years has uh, carries a lot of weight. That was honestly the perfect, perfect job for me. I loved it so much because the board of directors for the conservation district is mostly made up of farmers, several farmers I knew and several farmers that I had the opportunity to get to know over the years. And they are doing some really cutting edge and innovative work, uh, especially with the University of Georgia and uh, some of some of the I mean, it's just amazing what they're doing, honestly. And, and I'm so proud to have been played a small part in that and, and to have been part of that. So, yes, that that really helped me because it helped me find my voice and my passion. I had to learn how to do things that were way outside of my comfort zone, like nice. public speaking and interviews and, right. and things that things that most farmers are usually not comfortable doing. And, and so that's, but, but I'm really thankful now because it, it opens so many doors for me now as a farmer to have had those connections and relationships. And, and I think that the one thing that it did for me within the community is I was able to be a voice and a representative of the agriculture community in a positive way. And I was able to showcase all of the things that our farmers in this community are doing that are, that are, that show good stewardship and conservation. And, and I really loved that. And I, and I think that certainly helped build my relationship with, with growers all over Southwest Georgia and even the rest of the state. Wow. Well, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. It was a wonderful experience. And so how long has your family owned this particular piece of land that you're farming? Well, there, so our farm is split into a few different pieces of property, like most, most farms are. And so part of that property has, we can go all the way back to the 1840s with with a a part of that property, which is amazing. So that's where the six generations come in. The rest of it has been acquired probably in the last two or three generations. And, but my family has been farming in this area on the Flint River all that time. So it may not be, not all of, not this exact property, not all of it, but in this general region. So I had to have very strong ties and very strong connection to this land. Yeah. Well, and you know, I'm really proud. I live on a piece of property that I bought 30 years ago. That's three decades, but you're not talking three decades. You're talking 150 years. That in itself is <laughs> right. amazing, right? It, it really is. And, and I'm so thankful. How's that feel to you? I would say it there, there's such a responsibility that, that goes with that. I, it's, my parents really instilled the value of stewardship in me as a young child and knowing that this land has been in our family for multiple generations really compels me to be sure to take care of it so that it can continue into the next generation. Right. I wouldn't have what I have today if it weren't for the same stewardship value being passed down generation to generation. So I would say that that connection to the land is really special because and it also fuels my conservation ethic that's so important to me. Yeah. And so what did you do for the Flint River Soil and Water Conservation District? Tell me about that a little bit. Wow. Well, we, I will say we had, what I loved about it is that we had so many different projects that were all over the spectrum. When I'll, I'll give you a few examples. And it, it, it's just funny thinking back on it because it, you're just like, is that, is that all from one organization? Uh, but, you know, our primary purpose was, of course, conservation. And then we did a lot of really wonderful educational and, and education and outreach type initiatives. Uh, one of the things I'm most proud of and, and most passionate about is, is our work with innovative irrigation. We always called it conservation-driven innovation. So we would work with researchers at the University of Georgia, take what they were developing at their research level, and then secure funding to implement that on a larger scale, do technology transfer, and and test it at a commercial level on a, on a real farm and see if the technology was viable. And if it was, then we could work to secure even more funding to then adopt it on a larger scale across the region. And and so seeing how that research was brought to life with with what we were doing and, and the partnerships that we had with the University of Georgia and, and USDA, that was probably one of my favorite things because 
you know, we were we were developing technology that that I use as a farmer now. It it, it was it was very relevant, very helpful, and it, it we always operated in the in the space where we wanted to conserve natural resources, but we also wanted to increase efficiency for the farmer. We wanted to provide value back to the farmer and, and create this win win situation. So I, I worked in several projects doing work on irrigation. That was probably my main focus. But then we also had the opportunity to do some uh, much very different projects as well. One specifically that I'm also really proud of is we received a grant from the National Association of Conservation Districts in 2016 to start an urban ag conservation program in the urban area that was within our district, which is a town of about 90,000 people. It's, wow. a, it's really the urban hub for our region. And that they have tremendous issues with food access and food security. There are so many food deserts. There, there are a lot of problems there. And then there are several small farmers in that county and in that region that just don't really have a market or a way to get their what they grow to a, to a local market. And so we actually created this urban program that then became its own nonprofit called Flint River Fresh. And it has been really exciting to see that initiative grow. And it all started with just this little grant proposal and, and small project. And now it's this really impactful community organization with community partners and corporate partners and volunteers. And it's just, it's so exciting to see how that has really transformed several issues within that community and, and it's still early in the process, but I'm, I'm excited to see how it continues to grow. Uh, but it feels like it's really, it's making a real difference in the community. So I'm really proud of that. And, and then the, the last product I was working on before I left was actually a uh, feral swine control pilot program. <laughs> so when I say that we worked in a lot of different areas, we... <laughs> Did you say feral swine? Yes. So these are wild <laughs> pigs. So... Wild pigs. They so just a little background on why that's so important is in in our part of the country and really all over the country, feral swine have become one of the most problematic invasive species that to deal with. They not only destroy agricultural crops, they also are destroying natural environments. And so they are they are a huge huge problem. And so we were working on pilot projects to figure out how to come up with some me mechanism for control so that they weren't running rampant and destroying crops and destroying nature. And so that was uh, a really unique initiative we, we were working on. So that was really the one of the last things I did before uh, returning to the farm full time. I know more about feral swine than I ever thought I would want to. <laughs> <laughs> right. Now, are these are these pigs, domesticated pigs that got out or are they wild pigs? It's a mixture. They are really, they started coming over. You can trace these back all the way to the 1600s with the Spanish bringing them over. And, and then there, there's a mixture of some domesticated pigs that were released and then mixed with the wild population. And they procreate very rapidly and they're, um, they, they don't have a lot of natural predators in these areas. And they are just extremely destructive. So uh, that's that's a whole other rabbit hole we could go down. But <laughs> there, it, it's a it's a very complex problem, and it's one that the, the reason the district was very well suited to work in that space is because it, it's a problem that impacts farmers and natural resources. And so that was one of those places where we could we could really bring build a partnership to to come together and, and try to address that problem within within our area. So that, that was fun. I mean, I, I enjoyed that because it was so different from all the other work I had been doing. So mm -hmm. I actually really enjoyed getting involved in that. But it's, uh, like I said, all, all types of different projects within the district. <laughs> wow, no kidding. It seems to me that you are a young change maker in the, in the farming industry. How does that make you feel? Well, I don't, it, it's hard to see myself that way. I just, look at it like I have been given so many incredible opportunities and I just really enjoy doing things that make a positive impact, whether that's through you know, my role with the district or now being more in, serving on, on boards and as part of organizations that uh, serve the agricultural community and our local community. That's, that's just part of who I am. It's, it's, I, I just, that's, that's something that is really important to me is just to, to, 
re- be a positive representation of, of the ag industry and of my community. And so um, I'm just grateful because I've had so many doors open that were very unexpected. And, and it's, it was a little bit of a domino effect. One door would open and, and I would walk through it and then another one and another one. And it's just, it's all because I've had these people who have given me these opportunities. So, you know, I've, I've certainly tried to jump in opportunities that would benefit the the farm and the ag industry, uh, but I, none of that would be possible without those people who are, who are helping me and, and leading me along the way. And I say that you're doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing and the universe is aligning and just pushing you in that direction and it's working. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. It, it feels really good. And I'm so thankful for this, especially seeing some of my friends from college really struggle mm-hmm. to find their place in their career. I'm one of, I, I realize how fortunate I am to feel absolute confidence that I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. I know that's a rare thing to find these yeah. days. And I just, I'm so full of gratitude every day that that I actually, I feel like I'm on the path I'm supposed to be on and I'm doing what I love doing. And I'm just, I'm just really excited about the future and, and there are challenges and obstacles and I've certainly had plenty of those to deal with, but I, um, but you get up every day and and you're, you're doing something you're passionate about and it, it, it makes dealing with all of those, those challenges so much easier. Yeah. Well, and quite honestly, there are a lot of people out there that never find it at any age. So right. congratulations. Right. Thank you. Let's talk about your farm. Cause really the reason I wanted to connect with you was to learn about peanuts and peanut butter. So can you describe your <laughs> right. farm? Yeah. We'll talk about that in a minute too. Can you describe your farm and <laughs> tell me, you know, if I drive up the driveway, what am I going to see? <laughs> well, what the first thing that comes to mind is actually a joke that one of my farmer friends made to me a few years ago when we were talking about our family farm. He said, Casey, you don't have a farm. You have a nature preserve. Oh, nice. <laughs> and I love that because um, we we do have quite a few pine trees and, and woodland on our property, which is really special to me and, and to my family. That's something that uh, it's just, it's really beautiful and, and a really special ecosystem. And I could literally spend all day talking to you about these trees and this ecosystem. So I will, I will hold back on that. But we have, we have actually more timberland and woodland than we do cropland. So if you are driving down the driveway, you're, you're going to be just surrounded by trees, which is not what people really expect when you're picturing a farm and especially one in Southwest Georgia. Ours is not, not as typical. And then the other really special feature of our farm is that it borders the Flint River. And the Flint River is just absolutely beautiful. This is the one in Georgia, not the one in Michigan, of course. Uh The the Flint River is just a really special and beautiful place. And we're so lucky because our neighbor across the river is an ecological research center. Um, So it's just as beautiful across the river. And we are very remote and not developed. And so then, then of course, we have all of our fields that are nestled in within all these trees. <laughs> and we, uh, we have irrigated cropland. All of, all of our cropland is irrigated. We rely so much on water, which is why water conservation has been, and irrigation technology are, are two huge focuses for me. But we have, right now, we're, we're actually in the middle of harvest, which is my favorite time of year. So we, I, if you came to the farm, I could take you to our, our sweet corn field where we're, we're harvesting sweet corn this week and to our peanut fields where we are, we are hoping the weather cooperates and enables us to start picking peanuts uh, a little bit more. Uh, we're, we're a little behind on that right now. And I always like to take people to the river, of course, because it just, it, it feels like that that's part of our, our home and extension of our home and land is, is the river. So that's just a quick little description of, of our farm. It's, it's a very special place. <laughs> Sounds like it. I love that you live on a nature preserve. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> so this past summer, I actually had a young man on the podcast talking about nut butters and peanut butter. And, it, and around that same time, I saw the segment on Netflix about you and peanuts. So tell me about peanuts and where they come from and give me a little history there. Sure. Okay. Well, I am I am very passionate about peanuts. This is one of my favorite crops that we grow. It is it is such a special crop and such a unique crop. Uh, something a lot of people don't realize, if, especially if they don't live in the heart of peanut country like I do, is, is that peanuts are legumes and they grow underground. 
<laughs> so uh, when, when you're looking at a peanut field, you're really just looking at this, this small shrubby bush, green bush. And then when we are harvesting or dig, we start by digging the peanuts and actually inverting them from underground. That's why we have to rely so much on sunshine and dry weather for after um, during the harvest process is because we're actually digging them underground. Um, Georgia, where where I am, is, is the number one producer of peanuts in the United States. Wow! Uh, we actually produce about half of half of the United States peanut production is is comes from Georgia most years every year. And if you take in our neighbors in Alabama and Florida, you're looking at about seventy to seventy five percent of U.S. peanut production. So um, peanut production is, is really kind of limited across the country. It, it we have uh, it stretches over out west to Really, that border of, of Texas and, and New Mexico, there's there's some pe- a lot of peanut production there. And then it comes through the, the southeast and a little bit up into Oklahoma, Missouri, Arkansas, and then through the southeast up to Virginia. And that's really the only peanut-producing region in the state. And the reason for that is we have such a long growing season. We, I've had people ask me before that live in you know Oregon or Vermont if they can grow peanuts. And uh, while I appreciate their enthusiasm, it's, it's they definitely don't have the climate or the growing season for it in those places because um, it takes peanuts about 135 to 145 days to mature. Wow. So we're planting in May and harvesting about this time of year. So you're you're talking about you know five or six months of growing, and mm-hmm. so you have to have good conditions for that. So that's why it's, it's really relegated most, mostly to the South. But, it, you know, the, the Netflix documentary was a really great experience. I always like to joke with people, I am the peanut problem, <laughs> because that was the name of the episode. But, um, it, and it was talking about food allergies and peanut allergies specifically. Mm-hmm. And, and that's an area that I've become really familiar with as I've gotten involved in the industry. And one little plug I'll make is, is for the National Peanut Board, which, as you, as you mentioned when you were introducing me, I just started serving on that last year as alternate board member. And I'm so proud because the National Peanut Board was formed in the year 2000. And since 2000, they have contributed over $32 million. That's all peanut farmers' money from the, the checkoff program that we have. $32 million towards peanut allergy research, education, and outreach. Wow. And awareness. That's so huge. That, that is just, and that does peanut farmers money. That, because that comes directly off of our, our profits um, to the checkoff program. And that is, and those are peanut farmers making that decision. And some of the research that the peanut board helped fund really in the really early years was foundational and fundamental to the new early introduction guidelines that completely changed how the medical community recommends introducing peanuts in and potentially other allergens to to children. So I'm just so proud of, of all the work that's been done there. And I can give you some information later with some great links on, on all of that with, you know, scientific evidence. Because I know a lot of people, sometimes the first thing people that comes to mind with peanuts is peanut allergy. Right. And um, so just, there's, there's actually some really really positive news and, and some really great research that's being done in that space. And I'm really proud to be part of an industry that has been so proactive in that and so involved in, in trying to make that, to make that better for families who you know, are either trying to prevent peanut allergies or who are suffering from peanut allergies. Mm-hmm. Wow. Congratulations. So, like I, said, I could talk about peanuts all day. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, it's, if you have any specific questions, I, I'd be glad to, to answer those. Well, first of all, again, you're, you're on the leading edge of, of helping with something like that. Congratulations. And let's jump well, Thank up. you. But I, I hardly can take credit for that because that, that was all done way before my time. I'm just, I'm just really honored to be part of an organization yeah. that, that has done that. Yeah. Well, congratulations. So let's... Let's talk about your most significant professional contribution that we spoke about, Sesame Street. Oh, my (laughs) gosh. I I have to tell you, I was a little late on our call today because I pulled up the segment and I watched it. And it's like, oh, my gosh, this is so cool. So tell me about the segment. And then I want you to tell me how it came to be. Sure. Well, I I always joke that, that I've peaked. Because how will I ever top being on Sesame Street? <laughs> right. I, I like so many people. I, I grew up watching Sesame Street. Cookie Monster was my favorite character. So this opportunity that came along, which I'll, I'll share a little bit about how it happened, 
it really is one. <laughs> when I say it's my most significant professional contribution, it really it is. It was such a proud moment, and it's so special. And I'm just so thankful that I had the opportunity. And it, it's funny. I think there have been some reruns on lately because I keep getting messages and emails from people I know that are like, "I think I just saw you on Sesame Street." <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> And it's just, it is, it is so funny. Well, the, so the segment, first of all, I absolutely applaud Sesame Street for doing this because one of the, I think one of the biggest challenges that we face as farmers is, is just a, a disconnect with consumers and understanding yep. how food is made and where it comes from. Um, that's something that really worries me uh, as, as a farmer, especially a young farmer, about the just the you know, that, that disconnect and some of the misinformation. So I'm so excited that Sesame Street has created this segment. So the, the show I, or the little segment I was on was part of a series that they call Foodie Truck. <laughs> and that's where Cookie Monster and Gonger are making some kind of snack or, or they're, they're cooking together. Gonger is a new character. I didn't know about him. He was, he was new for me. Uh, he's a chef. <laughs> so he, I had, when they sent me the script, I had to audition for it. <laughs> was, I had to send them like a little audition video. When they sent it, I was like, I have no idea who Gonger is. I'm just going to pretend this is Cookie Monster. <laughs> but Gonger is this, this cute little chef. And so in my segment, they were making a little snack with some apples and peanut butters and Cookie Monster ate all the peanut butter. So, and, and Chef Gonger was very upset with him and they had to come to the peanut farm and the peanut butter factory and they learned how peanut butter was made. And I gave them another jar of peanut butter since Cookie Monster had eaten all of theirs. <laughs> so that, that was the segment and it was really cute. And it aired on the episode that was called uh, Elmo's Happy Little Train which was on season 49. And this all started because, you know, when when I said earlier that when one door opens, another and another, and it just keeps happening. So I was, I would always try to help people out with these different organizations, you know, the different peanut organizations. If they needed a farmer to talk, um, they knew I was pretty comfortable with public speaking because of the nature of my other job. And I had become more comfortable with interviews because of that role too. And just talking about, all, all of the things that we were doing with the district. And so I had a friend reach out to me from the Georgia Peanut Commission and ask if I would be interested in working on a children's educational show. That was all I knew at the time. And I, oh, was nice. like, eh, I mean, sure, I'll help. I'm not great with kids. So I don't really know like if I'm the right person, but like, I'd be glad to help. I found out later it was Sesame Street. And I was like, oh, yes, we will make it work. <laughs> um, but the tricky thing is they needed to film in February. Now, there's not a whole lot of peanut production going on in February. <laughs> so thankfully, we had some B-roll from a prior shoot that was like during Harvest, in the heart of Harvest, mm -hmm. that we were able to use. And then they were able to come and shoot some with me and, and just kind of make it look like it was peanut production time uh, but I had so much fun that there was a film crew out of Atlanta that came and they had they had contracted with Sesame Street to do my segment I didn't actually get to meet the characters that was the that, that was the sad part um, they didn't come come down to the farm with me but it, it was so much fun I loved the crew just amazing director and producer and all of the people who were part of that crew we spent um i think <laughs> i think we filmed for 11 hours the first day wow. so we got to know each other very well <laughs> yep. uh, i mean it's amazing what what goes into production mm -hmm. um and and so we had a, we had so much fun with it they made it i, I mean how can you not have fun with Sesame right? street so <laughs> they they made it really fun and then it took almost a year actually it came out about a year later so I was anticipating it that whole time, and, and I kept thinking, I was like, what if they decide not to use it? And I've gotten all excited that I'm going to be on Sesame Street. Mm -hmm. um, but when it came out, I was just, oh, my goodness, I was just so excited. It was, you know, the, the Netflix documentary, I was a little bit more nervous about it because I had no idea how that was going to turn out. And it was a really serious topic. and. I felt like, it, and, and I knew it would be seen by people all over. And I, I was really nervous about that documentary. But with Sesame Street, I, I knew I was just excited because I knew it wasn't, it, it just, <laughs> it's Sesame Street. Of course, you're going to be excited. Right. So that that's really the, that, I guess that's how, how it all happened. And they, the, the production team had reached out to the Peanut Commission and asked them for, they wanted a, a farmer and, and they really wanted a female farmer. And there just aren't quite, quite, there aren't very many of us. So, uh, and, and I, I certainly had 
done some interviews and, and things in the past. So that's how I got selected. And I will always be grateful <laughs> that yeah. they, they thought of me for that. Well, and I can tell from our uh, 35 minute conversation today that you're really well spoken. <laughs> So congratulations on Sesame Street and everything that you do. (laughs) I believe, my personal belief is that the most important thing we can be doing right now, culturally and worldwide, is figuring out where our food comes from and learning how Mm -hmm. to grow our own. And you are contributing so highly to that. So thank you for that. Well, thank you. So I'm going to shift on you and I'd like for you to talk about a time you failed, how you overcame that failure and what you might have learned from it. Okay, I might go a slightly different direction with this answer as far as a failure goes. This was this was a, a huge failure, not necessarily as a result of something that happened to me, but we're coming up this week on the two year anniversary of Hurricane Michael. So oh, that's yes. just really heavy on my mind. And our farm, we're actually located really close to the Gulf of Mexico. I, I can be there in, in ninety minutes. So and, and the closest point to us on the Gulf is, is Mexico Beach. And Hurricane Michael hit Mexico Beach as a Category 5. So most wow. of the time when when hurricanes come over Florida, Panhandle, they usually break up. And they're usually tropical storms by the time they get to us. So we get some damage. We, we might get some tornadoes. We, we might get some wind damage. But we've never seen anything like Hurricane Michael. It was a Category 3 when it went over us in South Georgia. Whoa. And it was one of the most harrowing, terrifying experiences of my life. It was it was really traumatic. We woke up the next day, and our whole farm looked different. Um, we had a sweet corn field that was completely flat. We had pine trees down all over our property. We couldn't even access most of our property because there were just trees down everywhere. We were so, so lucky that our houses were not impacted and our employees were all safe and that we were safe. Um, we lost our farm office. A huge tree fell on it and crushed it. Wow. Um, and this is obviously in the middle of harvest time. All of our neighbors were devastated. I mean, this was just one of the most devastating experiences and life-changing experiences I've ever had. And I know that's not exactly a failure, but it's something that, that you know, it was the same kind of experience, it was, it, you know, it, and and. So what I learned from it and what was so critical to me at that phase of my career and as I was beginning to transition back to the farm, I saw how my dad and mom reacted. I saw how other farmers started reacting and how we just started picking up the pieces, doing everything we could to get back on our feet and what felt like insurmountable odds. I'll never forget, you know, we just thought we were going to have to plow off an entire field of sweet corn and our business partner called and he was like, we're going to figure out how to harvest it and we're going to get it to market. <laughs> and so it was just this incredible lesson of, of resilience and determination that I will never, ever forget. And it was really jarring. I per- you know, certainly don't want to ever experience anything on that scale again, um, as we anticipate yet another hurricane coming through the Gulf this weekend. But And it also gave me so much more empathy for other farmers and other people who have experienced similar destruction because it's, it's just, it's, you hear about it in the news for a couple of days and then you move on to the next thing and it's but the, the people's lives are changed forever. Yeah. And it was just, I mean, it was just perspective changing. And, and but the other thing that came out of that that was so amazing is we lost power for 11 days, including at our sweet corn pre-cooler. And we had some neighbors step up and, let us use their cooler, which normally they're, they're, they're very competitive and, and you don't really do that. But it was just like everyone was just doing whatever they could to help each other. And it was just that moment of, of just everyone was all in for the community. I had people I knew in Atlanta calling and asking how they could come down and help and just people from all over the country. Everyone, I feel like everyone I'd ever talked to was reaching out, make sure we were okay, see what they could do to help. And so it was, it, it was just a really life-defining experience on so many levels and, and one I will never forget. And um, just something that's been on my mind a lot this week. Wow. So I know that's a little different than the question that you asked me, but a little bit timely Yeah, right one, now. One of the things that I've noticed in our conversation today is the rich life and experiences that you've had and how much, how grateful you are for them. And, you know, being somebody right. that's almost 60 years old, I can't, begin to tell you how valuable 
holding life that way is. So congratulations. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. What do you consider your biggest success? <laughs> well, I, my, I would say my biggest success is making the decision to return home to the farm because that has been the catalyst for everything else that's positive that's happened in my life. That was just that transformational decision. When I decided to come back to the farm, to take that leap of faith, to leave a college with 50,000 people my age and come back to a town of less than 5,000 people, not having any idea what to expect. And just knowing that farming could be risky and not knowing what the future held or that I would be experiencing things like Hurricane Michael, but still taking that leap of faith and choosing my heritage and my family and our land and this business and really pouring my heart into it over these last few years and becoming rooted in this community. That, that to me has been my greatest success. Wow. Congratulations. And what drives you? I would say the, the word that comes to mind and the one, what I would probably define as my core value is, is stewardship. I look at everything that I have, not just the land and natural resources and the farm, but also the opportunities, the platform, the skills, the community, the people in my life, everything that I've been given, I feel like it is my responsibility to be a steward of that and to use it to make a positive impact and to, to use it for good. And, and, and I feel very, I feel very driven by that every day. And so there's, there's certainly that conservation ethic that I talked about and, and that side of stewardship, but then there's also this other less tangible side of stewardship that, that really is always in the back of my mind. You know, I've been, it says in the Bible, to whom has been given much, much is expected. And, and that's really, that just stays in my mind. It's, it's, it's like, I need to be a steward of, of everything that I've been blessed to have, because I know how rare it is to have, have these opportunities and to have this, this farm and, and this, this background and, and the supportive family and community that I have. And I want to, I want to use that to make a positive difference as much as possible. Wow. That is beautiful. Thank you for that. If you could recommend one book for our listeners, what would it be and why? I love to read. <laughs> it is such a great escape and I love to learn. And so it's, it's always fun for me to read. Uh, so on the theme of stewardship, one of the books that I read in college that made a really huge impact on me, and I love to reread it when, whenever I have a chance because it's just, it is so beautifully written is A Sand County Almanac by Aldo Leopold. Oh, yes. And what really resonates with me, and if you've read it, you certainly know, is that just how poetic and beautiful he writes about conservation and land and the land ethic. And that was really the first time I'd ever seen in print what I feel like was in my heart around the land and natural resources and conservation. And he just does it so eloquently and so beautifully. And that book, for anyone that cares about the land and about conservation, would, would really enjoy that book. It's, it's just timeless to me. Yeah, the L- Sand County Almanac. Aldo Leopold. What one final piece of advice do you have for our listeners? I will say that the moments in my life that have resulted in the most significant growth have all been when I have pushed myself or been pushed out of (laughs) my comfort zone. So the advice I always try to give people is to get out of your comfort zone. Uh, If if you want to grow and if you want to learn and if you want to challenge yourself, that's the best way to do it because it's it's easy to stay in your comfort zone. But I, I just look back on the last several years, even just since I've moved home and how much I've changed and evolved as a person. And it's all come down to those decisions I made that squarely put me outside of my comfort zone. (laughs) So I I really make it an effort to do that as often as possible, even even when it's scary or when I'm taking a big risk. I know that, that that's where I'm going to grow the most. Wow, that is beautiful. Thank you so much for joining us on the show today, Casey. Well, thank you for the opportunity. It was great talking with you, and and I appreciate the opportunity to share a little bit of my story. Oh, my gosh, and a delightful one it is. How can our listeners get a hold of you? The best way to find me is probably on social media. Uh, I have a Twitter handle at KCCAS2. 
E-Y-M-C-O. And then I also have an Instagram for our farm, which is at Longleaf Ridge. And there's, uh, there's also a Facebook account for our farm as well, Longleaf Ridge Farm. So those are, those, that's probably the best way to get in touch with me is, is through one of those social media accounts. Beautiful. Okay, we also have a website at longleafridge.com. Uh, so that just has a little bit, and there's a, there's a way you can contact me directly on that website as well. Excellent. You can find show notes from today's podcast at urbanfarm.org forward slash Longleaf Ridge. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Urban Farm Podcast. Remember to listen for tips, advice, and resources to help you on your journey with urban farming. You can find us on the web at urbanfarm.org or send us an email to podcast at urbanfarm.org. In the words of Vincent Van Gogh, great things are done by a series of small things brought together. Be encouraged that with each lesson learned and skill developed, you are one step closer in the direction of your dreams.